Are athletes healthy? Yeah, of course they are. Or are they? As someone that's been an athlete, first as a runner and then as a climber, and even as a ninja warrior, there's something I need to tell you about every single athlete I've ever met. They all had some kind of injury. I don't mean that they were bedridden, unable to do anything, although that does happen. Instead, most athletes are nursing some kind of small but persistent injury. Type the name of any athlete you know into Google and add the word injury. You'll see that they have most likely had multiple injuries over the course of their career. And if you can't find an injury history, it's most likely because they have been injured, but not bad enough to stop them from competing. I mean, think about it. How many professional athletes do you know over the age of 35? Uh, they exist, but they aren't exactly common. The reality is that most athletes retire because of an accumulation of injuries over their career. And this fact is no more apparent than in gymnastics, where most athletes peak in their mid-teens and retire in their late teens or early 20s. Gymnastics is a brutal sport. You take a bunch of happy and excited five-year-olds and then subject them to a gruelling training regime. And the ones that survive without getting an injury get rewarded by doing more training. By the time they're teenagers, gymnasts will be training at least 20 hours a week if they're looking to go pro. And within a few years, the very best will be doing 40 plus hours a week. Unsurprisingly, that leads to a lot of people quitting due to injury. But it's not just the amount of training that causes athletes to get injured. It's also the repetition, doing the same thing day in and day out. And this repetition brings us to another question. Are athletes good at movement? Obviously, in their own field or pitch or court, as it may be, the answer is a clear yes. But what about outside of it? In the 2019 documentary, Resurfacing, we follow Andy Murray on his journey to recover from a long-standing hip injury and subsequent surgery. At one point, he spends time with Bill Knowles, a reconditioning specialist, and is tasked with trying some exercises and movements that he isn't that used to. Breakdancing and paddling aside, I think there is something really interesting about the fact that Andy Murray, who just over a year before, was the number one male tennis player in the world, can't do a good cartwheel struggles to vault over this box and makes rolling backwards down this slope look really difficult. Now this does not take away from his incredible tennis ability, not in the slightest, but you would expect one of the best athletes in the world to be a bit more capable, wouldn't you? Well the thing is, Murray does a lot of this, and this, and this, and because he spends a lot of time doing this, he doesn't do much of this. Now, with him being such an incredible athlete, I'm sure if you gave him a month and a good coach, he would be amazing at it. But it's still a surprise to see someone so great in one area being so meh in another area. And this holds true for so many athletes. I've met runners that can't climb, climbers that can't jump, and jumpers that can't catch. There is another factor affecting athletes, and that is that they move kind of weirdly. And this is because of the competitive nature of sports. The best movement to win a competition isn't always the best movement for the health of your joints. For instance, I'm a pretty speedy boy, but if I wanted to compete in the 100 meter sprint, then I would have to use a much stricter, more rigid and straighter running technique. And while I don't doubt its effectiveness when you've got to go fast, I do doubt its effectiveness when it comes to having healthy hip, knee and ankle joints by the time you get to 40. Another great example is throwing. Throwing is one of those things that humans are really good at. In fact, humans are the best throwers on the planet. But there is a big difference between the way a hunter-gatherer and a baseball player throw things. The best baseball players can pitch their balls at over 100 miles per hour. But you don't need a 100 mile an hour throw to kill a pigeon. Instead, you have to deal with the environmental factors. Do you have a clear line of sight? Can you throw from standing or do you need to be crouched? Is the target above you or below you? And is it moving? In contrast, pitchers have a large open space with a clear target right in front of them. And this allows them to use a technique that only really works in sports. Essentially, they use their entire body to generate force and then use their arm as a lever to multiply the speed produced, swinging their arm through like a whip. This makes for an absolutely monstrous throw but it also makes for an absolutely monstrous amount of force going through their joints. Again, this is not how humans naturally throw. This is an extreme variation to get the absolute maximum amount of power. And by using it, you give up on the ability to use it in many different situations, as well as giving up on the ability to use your arms. Okay, so athletes get injured a lot 
and move in kind of weird ways. But at least they eat well, right? Right? Well, sometimes. As a general rule, most athletes that I've met eat better than the average person, which isn't saying much, but it's a start. But, well, that's not always the case. This is professional ballet dancer Petra Conti. And whilst she isn't a sports person, she is incredibly athletic. And this is how she describes her diet. Because I need a lot of energy, so I need carbohydrates, a lot of pasta, a lot of pizza, a lot of bread. So bread in the morning. Yes, that is Nutella and banana flatbread for breakfast. And funnily enough, another ballerina, Teresa Farrell, starts her day with a corn dog and a ready meal. Overall, the rest of their diet isn't that bad, but when you think professional dancer, you don't really think corn dog. But you would be surprised by how well an athlete can perform on absolute and utter junk food. And my favourite example of this is Usain Bolt at the 2008 Olympics, where he set the 100m sprint world record on a diet of exclusively McDonald's chicken nuggets. Now, he did have his reasons, but it does prove that the diet doesn't make the athlete. As a general rule, I think the athletes have a bit of a problem with carbs and sugar. Between their pre-workouts and their energy bars and their energy gels and their energy drinks and the copious amounts of pasta and bread. My opinion is that whilst you do need some carbs for those short bursts of high intensity exercise, having that many carbs is just spiking your blood sugar and setting you up for heart disease and diabetes in the future. So yeah, athletes diets are usually better than the average person's, but at the same time, they're often, let's call them suboptimal. There is one other thing that athletes like to put in their bodies. I am of course talking about performance enhancing drugs, or PEDs. I'm no expert when it comes to PEDs, but what I do know is that at the highest level of sport, it's likely that almost every athlete is taking them. And you know what? I don't blame them. If a drug or combination of drugs gives you a 10% advantage in your chosen sport, and every other pro in that sport is taking those drugs, then you have a choice. Take the drugs, and be on the same level as everyone else. Or don't take them and try to make up that 10% somewhere else, which for all intents and purposes is impossible. So if you were in that situation, what would you choose? Does that mean that I think PEDs are good for athletes? Hell no, they are bloody awful. The side effects can damage an athlete's body for the rest of their lives. And not only that, it can lead to a situation where these athletes seem so far above you so unattainably incredible that it seems impossible for you, a normal person, to achieve what they have. And to show you just how prevalent PEDs are, I want to talk to you about the Lance Armstrong doping scandal, but not specifically about him, but about the Tour de France competitors as a whole. During the seven year period where Lance Armstrong won every Tour de France, of the 70 competitors, 69% of them are confirmed dopers. It's so bad, in fact, that the winner of the 99 and 2000 tours is actually Danielle Nardello. Everyone above him was caught doping. Do I think that PEDs are good for athletes? No. Do I think that PEDs make sports better? No. And do I blame athletes for taking them? No. But it is just one more nail in the coffin for the idea that athletes are healthy. But don't worry, we still have one more nail left. And that's what I like to call crazy dumb shit that athletes do that makes everything worse. Let's start with boxing and most other fighting sports. Pro boxers and MMA fighters do this thing called weight cutting. In boxing, there are different weight classes. And to compete, boxers have to be below a certain weight before the match. To somewhat avoid this, boxers will stay at a higher weight than they are allowed to be up until a few days before the fight, at which point they starve and dehydrate themselves for multiple days until they reach the correct weight. The day before the fight, they have their weigh-in, and as soon as the weigh-in is over, they eat and drink to try to put on as much weight before the fight as possible. As you can probably guess, this isn't really that good for them for obvious reasons, but it's probably worse than you think. You see, when you dehydrate yourself that much, you actually lose a lot of the fluid around your brain. And the reason that fluid is there is to pad your brain against impacts. So these athletes are going into the boxing ring, one of the few places on earth where you can almost guarantee that you will be punched in the head multiple times. And they are doing it with less padding around their brain than almost any other time in their entire life. So are athletes healthy? In some ways they are, 
and in some ways they aren't. So instead of the binary of healthy or unhealthy, think of them instead as very impressive people doing very impressive things. And to achieve these goals, they've had to make a lot of choices, some of them healthy and some of them not so healthy. You can of course still look up to them for their impressive feats of skill, strength, and determination. But in the end, they are humans, just like the rest of us. Except for the queen, she's a lizard.